Hi, thank you, Alisa, and thank you all for uh, for inviting me. I wish I was actually there, <laughs> uh, but the weather is not so bad here either, I guess, so I shouldn't complain. So welcome to my home. <laughs> um, okay, so I can see actually, I'm, I'm trying to see uh, some of the names, it's really exciting to, to present. Um, and um, I was uh, told that I should give you a little bit of uh, uh, background, uh, maybe fun facts, that would be better, right? Um, I know later on you have a lunch. I'm glad that I was not uh, scheduled after lunch because I know there's some kind of snoozing time there. Uh, anyway, so so I, I keep on changing the title. Did you notice actually the title was so technical? I was like, oh my God. And then I looked at all these other um, presenters you have in your group and, and um, I was thinking, wow, okay, I better uh, make it a little bit more economic. And, and and society impact rather than the techie stuff that I, I, I keep on saying to uh, people. So so I think what uh, what um, I will be talking is is, is this um, price of uh, degradation, batteries basically, battery degradation, state of, state of health and electrified transportation. And and I, I as you can see, I cannot decide what, what title I, I should start with. Um, so that's another one, you know, uh, the fact is what I, I will actually try to tell you is uh, not really just the accomplishments, but um, the struggles we have, you know, what we know and what we guess and how, how sure we are about this and why is it important. Uh, but okay, here's my background. Hey, here's me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you want this type of background? Um, okay, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll tell you this. I am from Greece, so obviously my name. Uh, says my last name, but please, if you want to uh, interrupt me, feel free and call me Anna. Nobody even ever calls me Stefanopoulou, um, except in the introduction. So, so I, I, I have grew up, um, you know, doing a lot of things that they're engineering. Um, probably my, my father is uh, quite uh, responsible for that. Um, and I grew up in the mountains uh, in Greece. Uh, most people actually know about the, you know, islands. Uh, but um, I also, one kind of defining moment in my life or let's say my growing up and, and my career is that I love to work with cars and I had a scooter and I still have a scooter, uh, but I also have like a broken or a fractured ankle. So, okay, well, um, this is a little bit of background about me. And then the issue was that uh, although, <clears throat> you know, I really like to, to work with engines and the best engines in, in uh, Greece you can find are actually in these amazing uh, vessels, uh, seas and fishing boats. And, and as you know, in Greece, uh, actually the most, um, how to say, um, you know, economic, higher economic activity and exciting economic activity has to do with seas and, and the, you know, our natural resources associated with, uh, with our sea. And so I, you know, I studied naval architecture and marine engineering uh, as, a, as uh, you know, in my undergraduate um, in, in our university, uh, one of the main universities in Athens. And then you say, huh, okay, so uh, I went, I'll, 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 I'll highlight for, for you that your graduate students, um, a lot of the opportunities and the kind of non-linearity in our path that we take as we, um, as we grow, as we select our studies and actually, you know, sometimes our successes are because of some, you know, dark times and failures. <laughs> uh, so, so um, you know, I, I was a naval architect and then I came to do my master thesis in Michigan. Uh, so here's Michigan, you know, the MIT. And I was invited by, um, to do autonomous navigation in the Great Lakes. So we were, um, you know, still a naval architecture, as you know, or maybe you don't know, but Michigan actually has the same sea, uh, lake shore, the same one with Greece. So when it comes to water, we have actually a lot of fresh water similarly. So I came, I came here and I studied naval architecture and I did a lot of controls and automation. And then of course the automotive industry kind of attracted me because are all around Ann Arbor where we are, there, are, there is a lot of uh, capital and a lot of um, human resources and just amazing excitement when it comes to automotive industry and manufacturing. Um, 
and that's uh, one of the also key points that um, you know I'm I'm trying to work with uh, with Alisa, as he said, a um, couple of years ago, a year ago, we we tried a lot to look into this issue about um, you know Michigan and, and and not just Michigan but Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio represent something like forty percent of the uh, total U.S. motor vehicle part manufacturing. So there's a lot of jobs there. And Michigan has a lion there as this graph, as this uh, map. So, so in the United States, the red and the dark stars correspond to manufacturing facilities. So what does it mean when we are going to transition from internal combustion engines that we um, have been manufacturing and producing all along for all this, um, you know, nearly now uh, 100 years to, uh, to, to, to batteries and, and other type of alternative power plants? Um, so, so this is uh, uh, always deep in, in our mind, in, in my mind here at Michigan, especially because we teach a lot of automotive engineering. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is another US map. You might have seen this long time ago. This was back when uh, Clinton was running uh, for president. I love that. That was my, my favorite economist uh, front page. It was the actually it's the U.S. map, but in a in a in some kind of constructed way that it's like an internal combustion engine that it's leaking and broken and and can see fix it right. It's like wow, you know my hero. And so I started dreaming. Can I improve it? <laughs> and um, I I really uh, like to think like that, because frankly, you know, internal combustion engines are, are clean, are extremely shiny and, and beautiful and highly efficient. And, all, and so this previous picture that was shown in that economist was completely uh, off. It might, it might represent the United States, but definitely not uh, IC engines. Um, so um, I was a big, so, so I worked a lot in the automotive industry, specifically with engines and engine control so that we can make them cleaner and we can make them more efficient. And well, maybe um, I have a little bit contributed in that pathway and look at this path. I mean, in the last hundred years, there's been actually a huge improvement in the fuel efficiency. This is miles per gallon zone over hundred years. Uh, plus in the transition as we started with you know basically in the beginning of the era um, in the in this 19th century we were actually figuring out what even to burn you know the fuel and then we had a, a lot of legislation that kicked in for emissions um, and then we started having um, the amazing uh, policy with corporate average fuel economy standards and catalysts and a lot of cleanup. So, so fuel efficiency went up, kind of slumped, slowed down for a while. And then here are the standards that we set nationally, nationally um, back in 2014, 2012, and, and the 2025 standards that uh, hopefully we will be revisiting soon uh, and, and reenact. Um, so, this is a really interesting paper, came out to trillion gallons fuel saved out of fuel efficiency standards. It, it is amazing. We should be all be, uh, you know, extremely proud. Uh, but, um, you know, there is the transportation data at the same time that shows that people drive more and, and there are just more people driving and, and that will continue happening, right? So the total VMT just keeps on rising. Um, you know, this is miles per vehicle. We're not necessarily driving more, but you can see that this is going up. Sorry, just constant telemarketers. So I'm just uh, responding and turning off. <laughs> and then you can see registrations of vehicles. So one thing that also I want you to, to be aware is that we, you know, we did not actually become more and more efficient in internal combustion engines like I saw, I saw before, I saw before in vehicles. Um, just because, let's say, we are making them slower. I mean, at the end, uh, the best fuel efficiency you can get is if you have no accelerations and you go from point A to point B with a very nice smooth trajectory. Uh, but you can see here that the actual displacement in engines went up dramatically and it just keeps on going up. Of course, you know, transition to SUVs and, and light trucks is, is uh, you know, amazing pattern. 
Um, and fuel consumption, meanwhile, per displacement stayed fixed and, and ra rather constant. Um, so how are we doing this? There is a lot of technology that gets introduced in internal combustion engines. Um, you can see these are like big waves of technology coming in and happening. Um, so you can see all, almost all of them have you know, fuel injection, this uh, in injection that is highly precise, um, you know, controls that they have, you know, feedback loops and feed forward loops and lookup tables, valves, actuation, advanced transmissions, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see the new technology that's kind of getting in more and more in turbocharged engines and engines that they have also even electrified some small electrification. So you can do start stop and you can do uh, some electric boosting. So a lot of things are happening even in internal combustion engines. By the way, you know, I have an entire lab that does all that stuff. And um, at the end, you know, as internal combustion engines, we keep on adding content and technology. Of course, it's cost, their cost is going up, they're cleaning up. So that's a nice also uh, point of view as fuel consumption is um, improving. So this is a redu reduction in consumption. And again, this is the 2025 original standards that I still stay, I stayed there and I'm gonna hope keep on staying and keep on improving. Um, you can see that cost um, also is creeping up as you put turbocharging, of course, diesels, um, they're going to uh, go away, to be honest, given what happened. Um, you can see hybrids and, and battery electric vehicles are somewhere up here. So, you know, actually way out, out here, but also still uh, quite a way out there when it comes to, to cost. So at this point, you know, you need to think, okay, uh, internal combustion engines are getting uh, more costly, batteries are already cost, you know, and everybody talks about where, where uh, is the tip point and, and what happens with fuel cells. So let me now go back a little bit um, to my background. So I was telling you, I was doing a, a lot of internal combustion engines and, and I went from naval architecture to engines. And I was in Michigan and I was doing engines. And um, I was brought back to Michigan as a faculty. I worked in industry. Then I worked actually at UC Santa Barbara over uh, south of you for a while. And then uh, I was you know, brought back to Michigan and as a faculty. And um, I walked into the uh, automotive laboratory and I just saw a room after room after room running engines and I thought oh my god you know we have to start doing something else here because again the transition is happening and and so back in the early times like 20 years ago well for you for some of you it's like you know before you <laughs> before you were even born maybe just about um, we said um, I said in, in my group we, we really need to pay attention to fuel cells and I had some really brave students. That's, you know, we're very lucky to be faculty uh, and, and professors. And the most important part and the fun part is to work with graduate students that are brave there than us. And, and they can take leaps and, and jumps. Um, and one of my students, Jay, um, he said he was a Thailand from Thailand, Thai. Uh, and he said, I want to just really work on fuel cells. I was also lucky to work with uh, a, a, a base that is over here in uh, Michigan uh, and some Fox engineers that they work with, uh, with the defense industry and they were uh, very interested in, in long-term operation, silent operation. We, work, we started working with fuel cells and fuel cells need a lot of controls. Um, as you take current, you need to adjust the reactants and the temperature. And, and I know you had another presentation earlier on, on perhaps on fuel cells. And so I started diving into that. And I did a lot of work in this area. And, and, and in fuel cells, you have a lot of interesting phenomena. Um, one of it, <laughs> uh, the best thing about a fuel cell, at least the um, the, what we call the polymer electrolyte fuel cell is that it all, only produces hydro, uh, water. It consumes hydrogen, produces water, so no emissions, right? Well, that is the best and kind of the worst thing about fuel cells 
because it makes them extremely hard to manage. The water, when it becomes liquid because it's low temperature, it sort of accumulates and creates a lot of inhomogeneities inside the pack. So I had a lot of students that they actually looked into that. And you know, actually water is really hard to measure. <laughs> so we went to a laboratory that um, they, well, a nuclear uh, reactor uh, where it produces neutrons and you can stream and create a beam of neutrons and use them as uh, the inverse of an X-ray and look inside the fuel cell, which you can do, you can see here, the beam comes from this side. So there's a reactor, here's the beam and Jason is sitting right there where seven is. Uh, when the beam is closed, is turned off, obviously, so he's not blasted and getting radioactive. Um, and then, and then um, we actually can see in real time, like in movie, uh, as the neutrons are going through the, uh, il the, the fuel cell, we can see where the water is and where the hydrogen is sometimes and actually try to understand what we're doing uh, with this um, water management and various kind of thermal management issues. Um, so here's an experiment that I went to do so that I can start understand fuel cells after I was working on engines. And then what happened is I look at this diagram that shows the neutron cross section of um, for various material. So you can see here hydrogen basically diffracts. So, so you can see hydrogen a lot. That's why we're using neutrons. Next to it is lithium. So the next material that you can also see with lithium is actually with neutrons is lithium. So I was like, oh my God, all these things I'm doing with fuel cells, I can do them also with batteries and look inside the batteries and see what's happening with plating and dendrites and, 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 and all that stuff. So you might know this guy, then when we went again and um, there is Professor Zinfan uh, Lin that actually now teaches in, in your, in your um, university. And he took over and he started studying these little batteries that he would attach on this uh, end here. And he will study them in real time and try to understand how they age and how they perform in, 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 in real time. So in a very, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that research is, uh, is uh, not well planned. <laughs> you have to follow opportunities and you have to keep your eyes open. And, and that's actually, you know, again, with, um, with some basic um, drive and a basic focus to, you know, advance um, uh, the, you know, if you, if you care about the environment to, to advance the environment, if you care about uh, other things, you know, whatever is your drive and your focus, of course, you are the energy group. Uh, so I know energy is your focus. So one of the things that, um, sir, so suddenly we start, whenever you do experiments, I want to say also is my favorite uh, mode of operation. Whenever you do experiments, um, most of the times the experiments will not validate what your hypothesis is. Sometimes it will, they will invalidate it, but, but very rarely will validate it. What you will do when you do experiments is just learn more. And most of the times when you do experiments, they take you also their own way. So in, uh, when we started doing neutron imaging, we wanted to see, like I said, what is happening inside the battery and um, with respect to charging and discharging and fast charging. Um, and so when what we did is actually, we um, managed to see this uh, expansion. So if I go back and forth, what we were actually can see more visible, more clearly as a signal than any other signals that we went there to measure was, was this expansion in the battery, a swelling. So the batteries breathe. When, when lithium intercalates inside the material, the graphite, there is an actual swelling. 
And that expansion is something that we can measure. And now from now on that I will start telling you a little bit of research stuff, then you'll see that actually we use this principle to understand a lot of things about aging in batteries, the actual expansion and this behavior. So when we start, I started uh, with batteries, I had also the privilege and the opportunity to participate in some of the studies about what's next and how to actually drive uh, you know, more the decarbonization of, of, of our transportation. And, it, and it's when you see this graph, it's pretty clear that, you know, I should, I should, we should put all of us, we should put much, much more emphasis and focus on, on battery electric vehicles. So this is uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, per mile. So the potential, this is the gasoline and this bars up here is where we are now. Um, the black lines, and you can see that if you, if we are aiming for a battery electric vehicle with 90 miles range, then we are improving dramatically our, our um, efficiency. Um, and these lines over here correspond in the red lines correspond what we can do actually if we um, improve in in our if we do we make all these improvements in in our technologies and these lines all the way down with the arrows point is what will happen if we decarbonize the source. And so here you can see, obviously there is a lot of decarbonization that happens if you go to pyrolysis. Of course, there's a huge question about how much pyrolysis we can do of forestry material to cover all the transportation needs of the world and, and where that can happen in the world. Um, but you can see that um, battery electric vehicles again have a lot of potential. Um, there is another graph in this paper. I urge you to, to study it and look at it. It's, it's very thorough. It's written by many, many uh, folks, including national labs and industry, and all agreed about that, which is the picture shows the cost. And the cost is a little bit flipping because the battery electric vehicle is actually more uh, expensive. And then the most uh, promising is actually the fuels, the plug-in hybrids. Uh, and another technology that you are um, addressing and you were pioneers at UC Davis uh, with Andy Frank and, and the group there were pioneers in the so-called long range uh, plug-in hybrids, right? Um, and, and the cost seems to be promising in this area. Unfortunately, we see that we're kind of jumping through this technology. Uh, so again, looking at all this, the important uh, takeaway is that if we want to sustain and stay within 1.75 or 0.5 degrees uh, Celsius uh, warming up scenario, and I like this graph because it puts things in perspective about what humans did and where we are and, and where we are, you know, just after the industrial revolution and where we're heading. Um, if, if we want to stay within this range, then uh, within the next decade or so by 2035, so in 15 years, we need to bring in something like half a billion of battery electric vehicles uh, in the streets globally, which is incredible. Because by 2035, that means you have to you have to plan for these vehicles to be all on 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 the road and, and operating, uh, you know, decades actually or a decade earlier. Universities have a. Uh, large responsibility to de decarbonize themselves, <laughs> uh, to be honest. And uh, I know you're also pioneers in that area, especially you know being able to decarbonize our scope one, scope two, and ideally even scope three emissions, which has to do with commuting. Uh, so let's take a look. I'll show you something that I did just very recently and I'm excited and well, you know, maybe it's not actually that kind of high tech or you know rocket science or anything like that but i want to put a little bit things in perspective when it comes to dollar signs and and why it is actually so hard to to move to electrification uh so ann arbor is a, a very nice campus it has actually as you can see this is our river um, and it has campuses this is the north campus the engineering with the music and drama school uh, and here, down here is uh, the central campus, and down here is all the stadium and the um, athletic facilities. So we, you know, I call it like a, we are a campus, we are three campuses with how many thousand <laughs> actually buildings separated by a, a river, but connected through these nice buses, these blue buses that go back and forth constantly and, and connect students, faculty and staff 
um, along this, this areas in this route. So you can see we're a bit of a fleet. We have 54 blue buses in operation. So we're like a little town, right? By ourselves. That's separate from our, uni from our um, Ann Arbor uh, Transit Authority. That's different, uh, completely different, separated from the schools, you know, the public schools, uh, buses and, and other things. So we did a little study. What will it take to decarbonize these uh, buses? Uh, when uh, putting a, uh, buying now an electric bus and a charger, it would cost something like uh, $400,000 more per bus. Half a million more. So, 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 you know, I went to the guys that run this business in, in my university who were wearing my... <laughs> wearing my professor hat and I told them hey guys we should buy electric buses and they said uh-huh okay sure and and how are we going to find you know 400,000 more per bus uh, which is completely outside our operational funds right and I said oh don't we have a lot of alumni can we ask for you know some donations and things like that <laughs> um, so I guess um Looking at the higher front cost is one way to look at it and definitely understanding the capital cost is important. But for, as you know, a lot of technologies that have to do with renewable energy and their alternative, one has to look at the total cost of ownership and the overall life. So the point is that um, this cost can be actually recovered even with this high cost now um, of the batteries uh, which caused the increase in cost in the buses, it can be almost recovered. In fact, as you can see, totally recovered because we can actually recover as much as $46,000 annually if we put, put our buses to drive on an intensive route, but they can uh, be only $30,000 annually providing uh, offset so therefore they will not pay back and they will leave us with you know, something like 100,000 cost at the end of their uh, 10 to 12 years of lifetime. So trying to understand what the buses can do and if they can pay back or not has to do a lot about these routes that you would put them in and if the batteries are going to last or long or not, and if they're going to, you're going to need replacements because they will need also additional cost. So the idea is, if you apply an on route charging, and you find routes that can be optimized and share one charger on the road. So I can show you here. There is a particular route that we found that was rather long, very popular. And this route, you can stagger all this existing route. So the vehicles are, are just moving the one after the other after, after, after seven minutes, um, you know, they come around. And then they can use this uh, 500 kilowatt charger on the road. Um, they can run as much as 49, 50,000 miles per year with something operate like 20 hours per, per uh per day on the weekdays, which is what they're operating at today, uh, but not one bus because now they're taking some buses uh, along with the driver to take their break and then they bring another bus inside this route. But maybe we can buy electric buses and dedicate that route to electric buses, share the charger, spread the cost and recover the money really quickly. So the big question is, will they last in this intensive route? Uh, this is if we take an electric bus and we just drop it in the way they're using existing buses, and that's the one that they is low mileage and it will not pay back. Uh, that's scope, uh, scope two emissions uh, in a sense, uh, but uh, there is also a scope three emissions, which is huge. And a lot of organizations don't account for it because it's complicated and that has to do with our commuting. Um, so because Ann Arbor is this uh, little space, uh, beautiful, high cost, a lot of people can afford living in, in, uh, in Ann Arbor and they, and they just come from far away. So we are actually generating about 100,000 um, 
tons of CO2 per year from our commuting. That's our estimation from our only commuting of our employees actually and students. So if you account for that, that's almost half of our scope one emissions. So if, for example, uh, you know, it's really hard to electrify our buildings and lower our scope one emissions, which is extremely expensive, maybe what we can do is create incentives for, you know, uh, some of our uh, employees to drive electric vehicles and instantaneously reduce their our scope three emissions. At the end, it is all CO2 that goes to the atmosphere. Um, so what we were looking at, in fact, is that some of our employees, uh, so about 10,000, a, a quarter of our employees, are actually employees that they're driving more than 20 miles. So, so these employees might actually need uh, home, uh, not just home charging, but actually a workplace charging. So allowing them to charge and commute in a sense for free in campus might be a good incentive because this way they will recover the cost of the electric vehicle that they will acquire. Um, and we calculated that. And so if we actually target and put the number of chargers in our campus to um, provide charging for this uh, personnel, then, then we can actually uh, wipe out 30% of equivalent to our scope one emissions. Um, of course, that's also costly. Again, um, you know, we will have all these cars now, uh, something like, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 cars that they can be in our parking lots and can be electric. And so they can actually, we can um, um, model it with, you know, match it with renewables. We can actually create uh, an agreement with our um, electricity uh, producer or, or energy generator, you know, whatever we can actually do uh, with smart microgrids to support and reduce this electricity cost from um, 8 million across the 12 years so that University of Michigan does not pay. Um, although it's not that much, to be honest, in the grand scheme of things, but you know, so I am to say, I don't, I don't have to pay for it. Um, so these are the type of you know, studies that um, I know a lot of universities uh, are doing and we should be doing. And these are great examples where we can put our, our hat on. And again, in this question that I brought in about how do we recover some of the cost associated with V2G and vehicle electrification and, and vehicles on the grid to recover some and create value, again, degradation is the key unknown in the, in the batteries. So having explained this, let's, let me a little bit dive a uh, few for the rest of the talk in more techie details <laughs> about batteries um, and what I really do, uh, you know, with, with, with my students in, in the lab. So we're looking into battery life and safety and, and what um, we're trying to do is protect uh, as this picture shows, so you have a battery with a, an uh, anode and, and a cathode, and then you're moving lithium from one side to the other. And the problem is that sometimes these lithium particles, they, um, you know, they don't exactly go the right, the, they don't intercalate as fast, they don't diffuse and intercalate inside the particles, and they kind of pile up and create these dendrites that um, can actually eventually um, create this plating, the dendrites that can short the cells and, and have some of the thermal runaways that we have seen, unfortunately, and have created some recalls. So there are a lot of other things that cause degradation, like electrode stress and cracking. I remember what I saw you earlier that we went and saw in neutron imaging as the battery expands it expands and contracts and expands and contracts. When you do this again and again and again, every time and you do it fast, you can actually make this as this picture shows cracking up. When you're cracking the particle, you can delaminate, you can disassociate, you can also create more layers that absorb lithium and you lose lithium that can be cycling now in all these cracks. And you can create, of course, defects and other kind of failure modes. So all these things are the things we as, how to say, materials people, and I'm, I'm not in that area, I'm not a materials person, materials person are trying to fix, are trying to improve, are trying to avoid. Me, that I'm a battery management person, like a controls person, what I'm trying to do is avoid these conditions, okay? And so 
to avoid these conditions, what I can do as a control engineer in the car is I can only control current and say, no, 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 this is dangerous. I am not letting you take more current. We call it a power denial. That's the only thing we can do. So as a control engineer, I have a little control authority in batteries. The only thing I can control is current and maybe the coolant flow and the coolant temperature, but that's very slow. It cannot protect really for fast things that can happen. So this is what I can control. Now, what can I monitor? I want to actually protect for all these things. And the only thing I can measure is voltage and the current that I know how much I'm taking and temperature. And that is not in every cell and it's on the surface on the cell and not inside either. So, you know, this is what I'm calling. It's like driving blind, right? It's like, this is ridiculous. It's like, they want me to protect for all these things, but I don't see anything. I just see voltage <laughs> and, and, and that is at, at the terminal all the way through. Uh, so we use a lot of battery state estimation instead of driving blind. And, and this is what we do. We are trying to estimate internal states, correlate with the few measurements we get and compare all the time to keep our models being accurate. And the things that sometimes um, are happening, like I said, is these hidden mechanisms that are because of internal states that they incubate the degradation. You just don't see it. So as you can see here, this is an example from a nice paper from Penn State group that have been working on trying to capture the physics. And so we follow them and tag along as control engineers to make sure our models have the physics so that when we take the signals, we can actually match, uh, match it with the understanding in real time. So, so there is a capacity retention. So our battery is losing capacity as they age because they start in these particles, fill up this film, starting this film that we call a solid electrolyte interface. And then this film starts growing. And so you lose capacity, you're increasing your impedance and you cannot take enough power, you cannot give enough power. And then, you, you know, everything kind of looks fine and pretty linear. So you say, oh, okay, so I just do an extrapolation and that will tell me when I will reach the capacity fade that they will make my car, you know, inoperable. And so what's the big deal? I'm done, right? Here is a linear line. I just linear interpolation and extrapolation will work. The problem is that what happens is you start building this internal also mechanisms with lithium plating. And when this plating starts happening, then there is an internal mechanism kicking in that is actually like a positive feedback loop. It actually builds in, it, it clogs pores, it reduces porosity, it increases gradients. And then it's what the knee is happening, like the knee point. When, when you start, uh, instead of having a linear uh, capacity fade, you have this increased capacity fade. And that's what we're trying to actually predict and not even predict, we still don't know how to predict it. We even try to make sure we estimate it. And we know that it's happening so that we can actually uh, sort of back off maybe in our BMS so we don't induce more degradation. So this is our, our real goal. Um, ideally in our estimation models, what we're trying to do is, as I said, you know, in these cases, um, we, we measure only this voltage um, but um, what's happening is we're trying to estimate and avoid uh, this, this uh, electrode here that is, is shown with this potential so that it, we don't, when we age it, we don't actually drive it into these lower uh, potentials and, and concentrations that will create lithium plating. So we need all these uh, type of um, estimators. And you'll say, hmm, so this is what I measure which is nice and smooth. And this goes is a signal from three to 3.6, right? And then what I'm trying to infer is when this internal signal that only goes from 0 0.2 or 0 0.1 to 0 0.6, so it's actually a very small part of this signal is going to reach this low value that it's dangerous. So if you have any voltage error here with noise kicking you around, this is gonna be probably almost as much as going around here and driving you, uh, make you, making you incapable to see this small variability. 
So what we do is instead of looking at the absolute value of the voltage, is we're looking at this, you see these transitions that I have numbered here as one, two, five. These are these plateaus. And these plateaus are happening because as, as lithium intercalates inside the graphite in, in the anode, it kind of intercalates in a particular way. It first fills in every three layers of graphite. Then once the three layers get filled up, it kind of opens more and more lithium gets shoved in, but the voltage doesn't change. So it's another plateau. And then once it fills in, more lithium gets in every other layer, et cetera. So the, the, the voltage has this distinct kind of drops. So what we actually do is uh, we're trying to understand what kind of signatures we should see from voltage. And of course, in the lab, we can do a lot of torture in our cells. <laughs> we put them in fixtures, we push them and stress them and, and, and put them in high temperature or low temperature, and we run them in various conditions, uh, like this picture shows, and we measure uh, a lot of this swelling and a lot of the electrical signals. We can also put signals and sensors in various packs. This is a pack from a, 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 um, um, a C-Max, a Ford a hybrid that has lithium ion batteries. And then what we do is we age our cells in the laboratory. As you can see, this is voltage as the age all the way from fresh and it loses capacity. Um, and this is at different temperatures and C rates and conditions. And as I said, what, I'm, what we're looking for is these transitions so that we can actually understand the capacity loss. The voltage doesn't, as I was saying, doesn't have a very clear signature. If you can actually measure the expansion and there is this large expansion, so, so batteries actually are swelling when you charge this charge and as they age, they become like a little pillow. Let me, I'll show you some really aged cells. Uh, maybe, or I have them somewhere, uh, maybe later. So they kind of swell. You can see that their thickness is, keeps on growing and that's because they actually, you know, they grow this mushy uh, plating and they can actually become bigger and bigger. And by measuring that, you can definitely tell more about the evolution. The other thing we do is we take the derivative of the voltage with respect to the current we put in and we measure the distance between the peaks or the height of the peaks. And that can tell us that knee. So here's the capacity and then boom, it starts dropping. So these type of signals can actually give us a good signature of what uh, this uh, telling us, foretelling us that the battery is, is really aging. And you can see it really quickly that it can happen uh, at some point. And then after that, the slope is much faster. So um, this is what we do in the lab. And I, I, I hope I, can, I convinced you that it's actually pretty hard, even in the lab. So now, here uh, you are as, as uh, let's say you work at uh, Ford or GM or Tesla, and you're driving and you want to create an algorithm that you will actually extract numbers as you drive from the vehicle, from uh, not you know, nice profiles, charge, discharge continuously at maybe low rate, but uh, during a regular maybe charging protocol or um, a nice drive that is not very fast or some portions of the drive, you're trying to get information. So what this graph actually shows is that um, if you just apply a regular, um, if, you, if you drive an electric vehicle and you uh, use it only around this uh, small depth of discharge, then you see this peak if you discharge it further, then you see the other peak that I was telling that you captured the two peaks. So the point is that if you are a risk adverse driver and you keep your electric vehicle always charged or at least uh, charged around you know, 80%, then you are barely going to see the difference in this distance between the peaks and you will not be able to actually know how your battery is aging. So what this says here is the error, estimation error in capacity for the anode and the anode capacity 
if you are these various bars or if you have a shallow discharge or a medium discharge, and you can see that you can have as much as 30% error in the capacity when you have shallow discharge. Remember, if your battery is 20% lose, loses its capacity, it's considered aged. And so actually the battery manufacturer need to keep track of it. So nowadays, the manufacturers occasionally do um, you know, various upgrades in their software. They do a lot of improvements in their software, trying to actually extract this information for battery capacity. And we're trying to still find good ways of extracting from the vehicle patterns like um, irregular driving um, and have good estimation of our capacity fade and then hopefully better prediction uh, using laboratory mixture of laboratory data and uh, real world data. So this is an ongoing effort and there's a real value for the owner, the vehicle owner, because predicting the life of the vehicle is important because obviously of, as I said before, for how you would want to use it if you are a fleet operator. Um, or if you are a, a home, you know, just a, a regular um, personal vehicle uh, owner, you might want to use your, your vehicle to do a V2G or a V2B in your building and, and therefore uh, later on perhaps uh, be able to, to uh, use it as storage, um, you know, help the DAC curve or eliminate the DAC, DAC curve. And then, um, vehicle resale value. Some of the big issues here is, uh, you know, our electric vehicles, can, can we use them secondhand? Uh, battery repurposing after they age for at the 20%, uh, how can you use them and put them on the grid? Um, so there is um, obviously still a, a big value for the manufacturers because uh, of the warranty decisions and, and how they would, you know, what is the level of warranty? Right now you have manufacturers that they warranty for 100,000 miles uh, or for, um, you know, certain number of kilowatt hours, amp hours. And, and of course you go with miles because that's what you, uh, you know, you tend to, to care as, a, as an owner. Um, but, but it's very important for scheduling perhaps maintenance um, although we say battery electric vehicles don't need any maintenance. Well, you know, it's not clear that that will be the case. Uh, maybe we will have some and, and have a better conscious, health conscious battery management. Um, so in, in, to summarize this, this portion of, of my talk, we do a lot of modeling and trying to actually do modeling that can actually embed itself in microcontrollers and have the mechanisms as much as possible and then go inside all these parameters, uh, measure very simple things like current and voltage and maybe some other things, and then tune parameters and, and predict the life uh, using this. And another way to understand why we think, you know, this type of area is important, the prediction, I want you to uh, consider this. There are a lot of people that work in the battery materials area, right? We know that the future in batteries has to do with silicon anodes. Uh, here they are in this graph with silicon. Uh, here we are with uh, NMC622. This is with low cobalt because we want to get rid of cobalt. We're going to even lower cobalt with NMC811. And then here, finally, in silicon. So these are like improvements in energy density and energy uh, um, specific energy. And, and these are the you know, billions of dollars that get actually invested in materials, right? So the controls people and the people that they do this kind of uh, real world onboard prediction, frankly, it's all happening siloed, siloed inside um, you know, our various automotive manufacturers without sharing data, without sharing information back and forth, extremely competitive. Um, but really, if we improve our confidence levels in degradation and in life, we can have a 5% improvement in our utilization of the battery. And it can make a jump all the way from, you know, using or not using silicon. <laughs> so what I say to my students is like, we need to convince the Department of Energy 
and the California Energy Commission and everybody else to do a lot more data sharing and a lot of a massive campaign in, in trying to do to understand more the life, the degradation in the real world uh, uh, scenarios so that we can advance more the utilization of batteries. Uh, and there is this big question with safety and allow me to use this uh, few minutes on, on what can we do with um, estimating the state of safety. Uh, so SOS kind of <laughs> like save our souls, right? Because if there is a problem in battery electric vehicles, I think it's the, better th the best thing to do is just uh, park and run. Um, so um, we have a lot of uh, faults uh, recently. We have a lot of recalls. Unfortunately, this is 2018 uh, data uh, actually produced and organized by, uh, by Sean Rui. Um, you can see, unfortunately, that some of these uh, accidents are what we call spontaneous combustion, that they're while operating and some of them while being parked without even being charged. So there are a lot of questions all the time about what happened. And what do we really, can we monitor? Can we understand the onset of something happening? And in fact, we need to actually even almost now monitor even when the vehicle is turned off. Not even to mention um, that you need to monitor uh, somehow and, and provide signal and messaging to the fire responders because if there is an accident and there is a, um, uh, you know, a, um, and there is a, and uh, suppression, you might actually have a reactivation. Um, so, uh, you know, battery electric vehicles, uh, batteries are, are really, their fire heat release for the same range of a vehicle of, um, of um, the same range of miles is, is much higher as this graph shows. So here again, this is gasoline electric vehicle. This is the fire heat release uh, capacity of an EV battery. So you can see that there is a lot more energy stored uh, when it comes to actually a combustible or fire uh, energy available for, en for fire. Um, so what we do in the lab is we actually, uh, again, having brave students that they blow up a lot of batteries. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's okay, it's all safe. We have hoods and, and, and separated wow. systems. Uh, we put things here in uh, sensors um, that keep track of, of the evolution and we bring them in, in this uh, complete combustion or parcel combustion. Sometimes um, we are um, looking at what is happening before the rapture. So these are batteries that they are uh, starting to degrade and swell not because of their material, but because the, there is a gas evolution and the gas accumulates and gets a, a little nice pack and then it would uh, looks like a little pillow uh, like this one. And it's just before it will rapture. So having sensors that actually can measure the strain and the swell, swelling or, or gas type of measurements, this is what we do is we measure the force as, as they rapture, the voltage collapses, and then we actually try to see the signals because sometimes you can have cells rapturing and even going into thermal runaway and you don't know because the other cells are going to support the pack. So you don't actually see the signature clearly all the way till the one thermal event of a single cell propagates to more cells and then you cannot suppress it anymore. Um, so again, developing models of thermal runaway and putting gas sensors and trying to understand the concentration of these leaks as they happen and when you have actually some ruptured cells. And, and the point is that again, safety will be critical for the transition. We will end up having more aged cells out there. We will actually have to recycle or reuse or repurpose a lot of cells out of all these uh, battery electric vehicles. And some of them hopefully will be recycled and will be inside you know, depots or beans transported to be recycled and they will be aged. And so we also need to actually even think about how to protect 
um, you know, these areas and the people uh, with robotic systems that they can actually improve all this handling of, of the recycling and repurposing. And I'm not going to get there. You're going to have to invite me again and even, um, you know, other people if you want and you're interested in battery manufacturing. I invite you to go to this uh, YouTube video where you can see the laboratory and how you actually man manufacture batteries. And the type of interesting things we want to look as, a, uh, you know, especially here in the US to maybe advance again and kind of reboot our, our battery manufacturing so we don't lose all this uh, type of, um, you know, workforce. So I'm gonna, um, I'm running out of time. And so I'm gonna say thanks a lot to my group and um, looking forward to sometimes meeting you also in, in, uh, in person. <laughs> Thank you guys. Is this an applaud for me? Yes, lots of applauses for you, um, Anna. So I'll, I'll give one here. Um, apologies in advance, I'm having computer problems. So usually what I do here is we have a, a few minutes for question and answers. Um, and I usually ask people to raise their hands and I'll queue them up. But I have to do this from a smaller device. So I'll see if you that works Do you want me to run not. it? I think I can see people uh, hands actually, Alyssa, whatever you want. If you have that trouble, would, I think- Yeah, I that would be great. <laughs> and that would be I, great. I have, just just call on people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, think about it. Let's see. No, <laughs> Sometimes no. we'll also see things in the chat line. Margaret, do you want to ask me something? Yeah, thank you so much. This was a really um, illuminating presentation. Uh, I just have a couple clarifying, probably revealing my level of ignorance about this question. But um, yeah. the, when you were showing the peaks at the 0.4 and 0.8 depth of discharge, I was I was just wondering if you could explain again what those peaks were referring to. I didn't I didn't fully understand. Yeah, it was way way fast, right? Yeah. So that was when you were saying that if um, someone keeps their battery fully charged, then they yeah. won't see the two peaks and they won't be able to tell the difference. And I was just I didn't fully comprehend what the peaks were. Ah, uh, yep, yep. Let me show you. So what I'm saying is, let me get to my right slide. Uh, it's over here. So take a look at this. Uh, oh, no, I'm not sharing. Uh, I'm not sharing now yet, right? Okay, let me share again. Um, do, 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 this one. Can you see now? Uh huh. Okay. So so when you drive, and let's say you were driving nice and smoothly, uh, or let's say you were just charging, you were driving and depleting your battery only for 10%. So let's say you go and you buy a, a battery electric vehicle that has 300 miles range, mm -hmm. right? And you are like me, or, you know, that I don't drive more than, ah, well, now I don't drive at all, but anyway, I used to be that I would drive, yeah, six miles, maybe 10, maximum 12 per day. And then I would come back to my house and I will be plugging, I would plug in my vehicle again uh, mm -hmm. in my house, right? So I just basically have a, uh, I, I, I just drive 10% of this, right? This is capacity. Yeah. of my battery so this is as i discharge fully my battery so if you think about it this is like your 300 miles range yeah. so if you drive only um you know one third or one tenth in a sense right if you have a 300 miles and you drive 30 miles let's say before you before you charge so just a tenth of this whole discharge so maybe your 10th will be around here, right? Mm -hmm. Then the point is you, you actually don't see because these lines are always the same. You, you actually, the battery behaves exactly the same. I, I should have flipped this graph in a sense, pin this to the same spot and then discharge it. 
or, or if you want to think about it, if, if you are, um, so what we do is we actually are looking always at this, you see this bump, this tra transitions here that happen from this slope to this slope. Yeah. This is this is what we are looking when we are trying to find the capacity of a, of a vehicle, of a battery. We're looking at this transition from this slope to this slope because this transition is happening at a specific stoichiometric ratio of lithium to graphite. So it's kind of a chemical signature that, that connects. Then we know when, when this uh, little kink here happens in the, in the, I call it the wrinkle. And depending on what amperes I, I, I cross that wrinkle, then I know how much my battery has aged. Got it. Okay. And yeah. that's sort of like a voltage drop that happens. That's right. Okay. It's like a voltage. It's, it's, it's drop. It's kind of a little bit more abrupt dropped drop. Okay. And so it, in a sense, what you do, instead of looking at this, you can see them more clearly when you take derivative of the voltage with respect to the capacity of the current you draw. And these are these peaks. Okay. And as you can see, this is the fresh cell. And as it ages, the peaks move. Yeah. And yeah. Two peaks, the distance between two peaks shrinks because the capacity of the battery shrinks. So unless you have occasionally a deep discharge, the battery management system will be totally oblivious. Okay, got it. And uh, only when, for yeah. the one time that you want to go, you know, see your grandparents or, you know, take care of your, you know, something, your friend that wants to, to you know, to, to go far away and you start driving far away, then it actually starts quickly calculating the capacity and you see that, that, that drop. Now, to be honest, we are looking for other signatures, um, especially during charging. Uh, but again, we have very limited capability because people, if people don't actually discharge their packs, it's, it is a problem. It's like low observability. Okay, that, that, makes, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, now I lost the, 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 hang on. Now that I projected, I lost the hands. There was somebody else. Oh yeah, Tobia. Yes, I can uh, yes, help you. Hi, th uh, thanks so much for the talk. That was that was really enlightening. Um, I I had one question. I or not really a question. I was just wondering if you had a comment. Um, it it always kind of uh, I always find it interesting that there's like this business element of of like wanting to put. Uh, a total total cost of ownership or like a warranty or what the you know the total price over the lifetime is going to be for a battery or your electric vehicle your battery storage system and i just was wondering if you wanted to comment how you have to like you have to report these kind of uh, business metrics even though there's still so much uncertainty yeah. as to as to when you know the battery's going to die when it's going to hit the 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 knee so i don't know if you had a, a comment on that yeah so there is a there is a huge uh, so right now the the way uh, we're handling it is we oversize we we create a lot of uh you know obviously a lot of a lot of um, buffers uh, because of our non-understanding. Non in fact, if, if, you, uh, if you, so, so what we do now um, is we, you know, we go to the lab and we do experiments like this, one after the other, after the other, um, uh, uh, with different, what we call aging stressors. And then um, automotive manufacturers, what they do is they have some kind of statistical understanding of what their, um, you know, their market, what, what their drivers do. 
So we connect uh, statistically, like the, the, the thing about the, you calculate the residence time in, uh, in high temperatures, the residence time in occasionally uh, fast charging that you will do. And then you go to your lab uh, models, the models that have been informed by repeated tests and cycling, and, and you come up with an estimate of the warranty. I'm not sure. Is this the question you're asking? Is how we do it, or? Uh, yeah, I guess. I, I mean, that was yeah. That one one component of it, and then just in general, I I just do you think that that's um, that's kind of appropriate when there's like so much uncertainty. I, I was thinking specifically when people say like uh, like a levelized cost of storage for a battery over mm -hmm. 15 years when there's so much uncertainty um, over that time period. I know, yes, I, it, it is an issue. I don't think, I mean, I don't want to, I, I think we, you know, I don't want to uh, destroy our confidence and, and you know, say back off, you know, uh, from, from, from electrification. I, I, that's, that's not the message I, 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 I have, but I just also want to say that um, there is a lot of, deep understanding and, and kind of real monitoring of real life um, development and, and real life demonstrations that, um, that we need to be doing to improve more. And, and bear in mind, I want to um, put it in a positive light, right? In a sense that if you compare, we always put technology out and we continuously learn and we continuously improve. And, um, you know, we improve, we, in fact, if you, if you think about internal combustion engines, they've been around for a hundred years. We almost like maxed out, or nearly maxed out their efficiency. We still don't have a fully, um, a full understanding of combustion, <laughs> right? So at the end, the fact you don't understand everything should not stop you. But I think you need to, um, you know, I, I think there is um, a lot more awareness that needs to be built and a lot more research, systematic research needs to happen uh, associated with the type of real-time monitoring and um, uh, real-time assessment of, of health and life and improvements when it comes to, you know, uh, service, uh, adjustments in the battery management so that you don't have degradation that happens and happens rapidly. So there's still a lot of things to be done. Right now, a lot of manufacturers are just, are just um, starting by using a lot bigger batteries and operating first at a smaller window. And as the battery age, you never get to see that knee point because they keep on opening the utilization. Um, and, um, you know, I understand that, but, you know, as we try to, to put the cost down, we want to close this window. <laughs> and I think that's what I'm talking about. It's like, you know, downsizing, even in batteries <laughs> and, and making it nimble and, and efficient and making people feel comfortable to drive a 90 miles range vehicle instead of a 300 miles range vehicle and just drive around with a couch. This is like an entire couch of a battery. Why do you even need it? Thanks. All okay. right, I see, I see one more hand up um, from, from Dan. Dan. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for sharing with us today. It's a wonderful presentation. Um, I had, uh, though a lot of technical stuff went a bit over my head. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> More of a big picture question, but in talking about the the need for information sharing in research and development uh, between industry and education institutions, um, and given the timeline that we're looking at for implementation of these technologies, do you think, from your vantage point, do you see something that public policymakers or policymakers could do or should do to try to increase 
this uh, to try to push forward that kind of information sharing? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I just, there's so much policy can do so much faster than anything I can do, to be honest. Uh, so, um, um, okay. Um, an example, we have a lot of demonstrations out there, right? Um, we have a lot of incentives, uh, even for buses, right? E you know, electric school buses, buses, transit buses, there is the Federal Transit Agency Authority, uh, you know, funds, you know, all these funds that, that they are used to uh, electrify fleets and, and we should be doing it and we're doing it and, and that's great. But then shouldn't we match this um, demonstration with the learning and, and broad learning and, and somehow, you know, encourage the data uh, gathering and, you know, um, and, and a depository of data, a, a way that we can, you know, sort of uh, create a, a health passport, uh, some kind of, you know, signatures. Um, uh, they, they, they are talking about it in, in Europe that they're way more advanced than us, uh, developing a health certificate uh, for, for cells and batteries that um, you know you can interrogate uh, when you need to, to decide about repurposing and uh, some signals in fact maybe they should be there about messaging for safety you know we don't have any of that right now um, I mean there are a lot of SAE standards and there are, there is a lot going on uh, with um, with committees at SAE and 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 many other organizations, um, but there's not much sharing um, of various chemistries, various um, real world data that, that I can correlate. I can try to see, you know, I, I, I just got off the, in my previous uh, meeting, I was meeting with Sandia and they were saying that they're aging their cells and then they, they never see the knee and they're down to 50%. And how come I see the knee? You know, and so there's like all this understanding that, that I, we could actually have if we have data and I think most of the demonstrations, ideally, they should come along with some data sharing um, uh, imperative or, or incentive or, or you know, uh, guide line. Um, I don't think there is there. I understand there is a lot of um, confidentiality and uh, you know, competition in the field um, that will deter, in fact, some demonstrations from happening. We don't want that to happen either. But frankly, there is uh, there are ways that we can interrogate systems and anonymize, uh, aggregate data so that it doesn't necessarily point to even manufacturers, vehicle manufacturers, it doesn't even point to battery manufacturers. So I, I think there is there is a lot to be done in that front. So we usually um, finish up at uh, eleven fifty, but I see that um, Giltel has raised his hand. So maybe if we want to take one last quick question uh, before um, closing the seminar, Gil, go right ahead. Ouch, I didn't want to be the guy that make everyone late for lunch, but, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, it's, a, it's a great presentation. And actually, some of my question was already answered about the policy. So I will take it, I will take it to the next, next uh, step because uh, I think that, that, that what you're doing is really, really important for growing the, the EV uh, uh, market and, and fleet. And we are struggling right now. I got a question from the state of California on how to create uh, some kind of health passport or some kind of insurance for second uh, a market for low income people who buy used elect electric cars. And what, 
And this is exactly the kind of policy that you were talking about. We need to create some kind of insurance policy if you buy a 10 years old car with 100,000 miles on it that, that you know that it would still be it would still be good. So my question is, do we need to go to the chemistry or let the OEMs, do they trick whatever they want to spend more money on a hidden capacity that they will use later or spend more money on better uh, thermal management of the battery or whatever they want. And we should just kind of stay outside and say, you have to have X amount of range by this age. And also the other question I have is, do we also need to talk about um, catastrophic failure, like reliability and dependability of the battery and not just uh, in capacity and range? And I will stop here. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So this is this is really important. It's uh, in the whole equation of uh, total cost of ownership. The second-hand vehicles, uh, you know, are are, are uh, in the equation. And a lot of people apparently, you know, they they worry about that, and and you know, they say, oh, you know, no. Um, so. Um, I, I think there needs to be a standard or an, an independent, ideally, uh, process for which, you know, it's almost like, you know, the onboard diagnostics we have in, in our internal combustion engines. Um, you know, ideally, the OEMs first, you know, need to do their, their, um, their part in um, messaging coming up with signals that uh, they, they, they do a self-diagnose, right, onboard diagnostics, and they provide this information and they actually, we need to have a, a way of uh, checking that this is happening and it's happening correctly. So I think I would, I would go there first and, and model the batteries the same way we have an existing structure now and then the question is, you know, what are the specific um, uh, metrics and, and behavior that we need to establish that the OEMs, um, you know, need to perform? And, and that's, you know, when we did onboard diagnostics and we developed all, all that with CARB and the California Energy Commission and, and other entities needs IPA, um, you know, it was it was a collaborative effort with the OEMs screaming and yelling, but coming along because they knew that, <laughs> you know, it's going to happen. Uh, but, you know, and they wanted to be part of the discussion and, and the team. And I think at the end, this is what needs to happen. You know, they are putting a lot of time and effort and they put a lot of resources themselves. So uh, talking, I work a lot with industry and then talking with with them. Um, you know, the, they do take risks uh, all the way from what kind of warranties they should put forward. Uh, but on the other hand, they limit a lot of things to make sure the warranty stands, right? Like, you know, you still cannot do V2G and V2B for many, many vehicles out there. So I think they're all thinking about it and they know that they will have to do it. In Europe, it, it almost has started or it's, it's going on. So I think we need to look a little bit at the European Union that they have and, and uh, do it again, do an international effort even, uh, even beyond. So ideally it will not be a California effort. It will be a US effort. And if it is possible, it should be an international effort because a lot of our aged vehicles end up all over the world. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to, uh, help you, Jill, and thank you for spending time attending my seminar. I'm proud. <laughs>